Good morning to one and all present here. On behalf of PG and Research Department of Mathematics, DG Vaishnav College, I welcome everyone to the national webinar on mathematics of fractals. And examples of fractals are everywhere in nature. They can be found in the patterns of trees, branches, and ferns, in which each part appears to be smaller image of the whole. They are found in the branch-like patterns of river systems, lightning, and blood vessels. We are going to learn about fractal and fractal dimensions. Prayer is an opportunity to spend time with God. We will start our session with Tamil Thai Vathu followed by college prayer. A fractal is a way of seeing infinity. You won't need a special equipment. You just need your mind. Mathematics is pure. It does not rest or decay. It only needs to make it work. Mathematics goes beyond the real world. Yet the real world seems to be ruled by it. Now, I would like to invite Professor M. Deviga, PG and Research Department of Mathematics, DG Vaishnav College to give the welcome address. When we strive to become better than we are, everything around us becomes better. Good morning to all. I heartily welcome everyone present here. On behalf of Postgraduate and Research Department of Mathematics, DG Vaishnav College, for the national webinar on Mathematics of Fractals. I extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to the management of DG Vaishnav College, the Secretary, Sri Ashok Kumar Mundraji, the principal, Dr. S. Santosh Babu of DG Vaishnav College for their support in conducting the webinar series. I feel privileged and honored to welcome our resource person, Dr. S. Mini Rani, Associate Professor of Mathematics, Department of Basic Sciences and Humanities, 
Mukesh Patel School of Technology, Management and Engineering, NMIMS, Mumbai, India. I welcome Professor R. Venkatramanan, Head of the Postgraduate and Research Department of Mathematics of DG Vaishnav College, and all the teaching faculty, research scholars, and students across India. Dr. S. Minirani has published many research papers in reputed international journals in the areas of fractal geometry, fixed point theory, graph theory, and oceanography. She is a course coordinator and content developer for MOOC programs under MHRD and UGC on DTH and SPOIM platforms. She is also a research guide for PhD at NMIM. Her research interests include fractal geometry, discrete mathematics, fluid dynamics, and oceanography. Dr. S. Minirani has received many honors and awards. She has received Outstanding Women in Science, Venus International Women Awards 2018, IMRF Best Scientist Award in Mathematics, IMRF 100th, Con 100th Conference at Goa, Government of India approved, Bharat Excellence Award in Mathematics, Friendship Forum 2019. She is an academician par excellence and also a great administrator. It's indeed a great privilege for having you with us, madam. Today's webinar is about mathematics of fractals. In mathematics, a fractal is a self-similar subset of Euclidean space whose fractal dimension strictly exceeds its topological dimension. Fractals appear the same at different levels. The term fractal was first used by mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot in 1975. Mandelbrot based it on the Latin fractus, meaning broken or fractured, and used it to extend the concept of theoretical fractional dimensions to geometric patterns in nature. Fractals help us study and understand important scientific concepts such as the way bacteria grow, patterns in freezing water, that is snowflakes, and brain waves. For example, wireless cell phone antennas use a fractal pattern to pick up the signals better and pick up a wider range of signals rather than a simple antenna. This webinar introduces some of the concepts on fractals. Dear participants, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. And today's destiny leads us to the exploring the world of fractals. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dear participants, your active participation is important throughout the program. You can post your questions and comments in the chat box. Feedback link will be posted in the chat box at the end of the session. Now, I welcome Dr. R. Arundhati, Assistant Professor, PG and Research Department of Mathematics, DG Vaishnav College, to introduce our resource person. On behalf of PG and Research Department of Mathematics, PG Vaishnav College, a warm and helping morning to us. I take great pleasure to introduce our resource person, Dr. S. Pini Rani, Associate Professor of Mathematics, Department of Basic Sciences and Humanities, NMIMS Mumbai. Dr. S. Minirani graduated in mathematics from Malabar Christian College, Calicut in 1997. She has secured first rank in MSc Physical Oceanography from Calicut University of Science and Technology in 1999. She has also done master's degree in mathematics in St. Joseph College, Devagiri in 2006. She has completed her PhD in mathematics from NIT Calicut in 2015. Dr. Minirani has 13 years of teaching experience in various reputed institutions and two years of research experience in National Institute of Oceanography, Kochi. Currently, she is working as an associate professor in mathematics, Department of Basic Sciences and Humanities, NMIMS Mumbai. She is a recipient of the following awards. Best Paper Award in National Meet of Research Scholars, IIT, BHU in 2012. Outstanding Woman in Science in Venus International Woman Award, 2018. 
IMRF Best Scientist Award in Mathematics in the 100th Conference of IMRF at Goa. Bharat Excellence Award in Mathematics Friendship Forum in 2019. She is a life member of various professional organizations and reviewer of Mathematical Reviews, American Mathematical Society. She is course coordinate and content developer for MOOC programs under MHRB and UGCR, TDH and Science platforms. She has published many papers in reputable journals in the area of fractal geometry, fixed point theory, graph theory, and oceanography. She is the author of the book Fractal Space Introduction and Application. She has been a chairperson and a resource person for many national and international conferences. Due to lack of time, I am unable to say her full credential, and so I have highlighted like few only. On behalf of PG and Research Department of Mathematics, I once again welcome you, ma'am, for this webinar. Now I hand over the session to you, ma'am. A very good morning to one and all. Uh, that was indeed a very big introduction, I should say, ma'am. Uh, even though you have uh, told that lack of time, you have only listed a few. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction um, uh, about me and also about uh, fractals uh, given by uh, uh, your faculty. Uh, and I would uh, like to also thank uh, the uh, PG and Research uh, Department of Mathematics at uh, uh, DG Vaishnav College for giving me an opportunity uh, to speak on the topic, uh, which is actually my uh, research area. And uh, I would uh, always love to, uh, I'm a person who would always love to uh, speak about uh, fractals, but um, uh, in this one, one and a half hours or one hour, 15 minutes, I don't know how much I'll be able to cover. But I think uh, the um, the organizers have already given a glimpse of uh, uh, what fractals is. And I should say uh, fractal geometry is the geometry of nature. So let me uh, share my screen. Let us uh, start. Uh, Hope my uh, screen is visible. It's not. It's visible. Hello. Hello. Visible. We can proceed, ma'am. It's visible, no, ma'am. Visible. Visible, ma'am. Yeah. Can... Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So, can I start? Yes, ma'am. You can start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the topic of uh, the day is mathematics of fractals. So you'll be wondering what fractals is, but I I don't I know some of you people who are attending this conference would uh, sorry this uh, talk would definitely uh, uh, know what fractal is, and some of you may be also working uh, in the area of fractals. For them, I think it would be uh, just uh, a revision of what you know, uh, or else what you've al already learned. Uh, so I thought of introducing it uh, from the basics and just in, uh, introduce you to the uh, different properties, uh, what makes it different or uh, how is it different from the normal objects uh, which we have studied in mathematics or the normal Euclidean objects that we have studied in mathematics. So according to me, uh, uh, the Euclidean geometry was just uh, a way in which Euclid has approximated the natural objects. Uh, that we see around us. And this fractal geometry actually uh, is being identified or being called as the uh, geometry to define nature. So what I would like to say is it will actually make you see things differently. That is, uh, I should say there's a danger also in understanding about it further. That means uh, you lose your childhood vision of clouds, forests, and gal galaxies once you know the uh, roughness or else the uh, nature that we are going to talk about. Uh, so your interpretation of these things or the uh, beauty which you used to see uh, is uh, this fractal geometry helps you to understand it uh, uh, using uh, the proper mathematics of it. Uh, 
see this observation by mandelbrot uh, of this existence of geometry of nature has led to uh, think in a new scientific way about the edges of the clouds or the profiles of the top um, of the forest of the horizon uh, so geometry of nature or else uh, that is that is actually the fractal geometry uh, so geometry is um, basically concerned with making our spatial intuitions objective okay so your classical geometry or the euclidean geometry gives you a first approximation to the structure so that are there, that is uh, the physical objects so it is a language in which we used to communicate the designs of technological products and very approximately the forms of uh, natural creations so fractal geometry is just an extension of the classical geometry it can be used to make precise models of physical structures from ferns to galaxies so it is a new language i should say uh, which we have not learned in schools so once you can speak it you can describe the shape of a cloud more precisely than you uh, an age of 30 to 40 years and uh, i would like to uh, start uh, uh, the day with a uh, or else my presentation with a quote just like uh, the organizers did today uh, uh, let me quote uh, uh, the famous mathematician. I would like to call him. Uh, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious, and it is the source of all true art and science. So this uh, mystery or the search of mystery has ha actually led uh, to the um, invent of all these things uh, that that is there around us, or the discoveries that is there around us. Uh, so why is geometry often described as cold and dry? So one reason lies uh, uh, in, I should say, like uh, its inability, the geometry that I'm talking about is the Euclidean geometry. So you know that the shape of a cloud or a mountain, say me for a mountain, you have the best approximation using a triangle. Uh, coastline means it may be a straight line or else for a tree, the bark of a tree, you will use a cylinder. So actually, uh, this is a famous line uh, by Benoit Mandelbrot, who is considered to be the father of fractals. Uh, the clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, uh, coastlines are not circles, and the bark is not smooth, nor does the lightning travel in a straight line. So what all objects that we see around us, just like the clouds, or the mountains, uh, the bark of a tree, or the lightning, all are examples of fractals. So uh, in, uh, you can see if you look around, the nature always uh, exhibits a higher degree of complexity, okay, or a different level of complexity, I should say. Uh, see, the number of distinct scales of length and patterns is of all purposes, so it's infinite. And uh, the existence of these patterns actually challenges us to study these forms of uh, Euclidean uh, objects. So we have to keep them a little bit aside and start to investigate. Uh, a new branch or a new theory to study all these things. Uh, so if you just uh, Google and from MathWorld, this would be the um, definition that you may get. A fractal is an object or quantity that displays self-similarity in a somewhat technical sense on all scales. Uh, so uh, fractals need not exhibit exactly the same structure at all the scales, but some same type of structures must appear on all scales. Uh, so what does that mean? So I would like to just show you uh, this example, uh, which I should say it is considered to be the logo or emblem of fractals, which is the Mandelbrot set. I'll just show you how it was created or how it was being drawn by Mandelbrot also. Mm, uh, uh, so you can see uh, this is an object which, was, which is uh, considered to be uh, having all the shapes and all the, um, what do you say, all the geometric shapes that you can see in nature. See, you can have, you can see circles, you can see cardioids, you can see uh, approximations of all the things, lines or curves, everything. And this is just a zoom in uh, for that uh, Mandelbrot set. So as you zoom in and in, that means you go on in uh, scaling it. Uh, so what happens is you keep on seeing the similar patterns inside. OK, uh, the thing is like, see, whenever we consider a curve or an object, always uh, we try to mathematically uh, using the Euclidean geometry, we always try to uh, 
uh, approximate it in such a way that as we zoom in or uh, go closer or we make the delta x tends to zero, it approximates to a straight line or also smooth surface. But in this case, uh, for fractal objects, it is not the same. So we'll see uh, the properties one by one. So uh, what is the basic idea of uh, geometry or what, uh, what does geometry deal with? So you know that geometry deals with uh, the objects and spaces. So when I'm talking about objects, you have uh, idealized objects and non-idealized objects. And when I talk about spaces also, you, should, you need to understand there are idealized and non-idealized spaces. So what are these objects actually? Uh, see, uh, this is uh, often uh, missed in the way it has been taught, I think, most of the times. See, the objects that we are talking about uh, mathematically, for mathematicians, it would be like points, lines, spheres, uh, the rectangular parallel pipes, or, or else all the other objects that we deal with. Okay, And you know that they live in some space. So uh, say, for example, a zero dimensional point lies in a one dimensional line or a two dimensional plane, if you can say, or else any other higher dimension. And when I talk about a one dimensional line or a curve, it can live in a two dimensional space or a three dimensional space. So if we talk about objects uh, living in spaces, we can see that objects can always live in spaces of higher dimensions. So we'll come to dimensions also. What is the notion of dimensions, how we used to understand it? And uh, so when we look back the human history, we can see that people have always studied about the regular objects. The regular objects or the idealized objects, which I mean, are the uh, lines, spheres, triangles, uh, the rectangle, par parallel pipes, or uh, what you say, the cylinders. See, all those were the objects which I should say idealize or smooth or else, uh, what do you say, uh, regular regular objects which we were studying. OK. Um, and these are actually the idealizations of uh, what we see in nature. Sometimes I should say, as I told you, we would have started studying about the um, uh, cylinder, maybe uh, seeing the bark of a tree, or else cones by seeing the mountains. So that was the best approximation or the idealization that we have found from nature only. And this was a sort of legacy that, is, that was uh, given to us by Pythagoras and Euclid. And uh, this, uh, they, uh, they have idealized the objects and we started studying about these. Okay, So when we are talking about the spaces, um, and again, we are talking about the flats, uh, flat surfaces. See, uh, the surface of a paper or also 2D space that we talk about, you know, it is a flat surface. And 3D space also, it has been a uh, three-dimensional uh, space formed by flat surfaces. So mathematically, uh, if we have to find the minimum distance between two points, we draw a line and use the Pythagoras uh, law. So we had always uh, dealt with idealized objects and or else idealized spaces or the flat uh, spaces we are very much familiar to. See, by the end of 19th century, you know that uh, uh, the, in the geometry, the work of Freeman, Gauss, or uh, Lobachevsky had uh, also defined other types of uh, curved surfaces, maybe positively curved surface, negatively curved surface. And Einstein had uh, discovered a profound application also of this uh, theory uh, in, in his theory of gravitation, actually. So, but still, uh, but still we see that idealized objects remained, even though the flat surfaces were uh, replaced by curved surfaces in, to explain uh, so many uh, theory from physics. Uh, but again, we st continued with this idealized objects and learning uh, uh, about approximations of the natural objects using these regular or idealized objects. So, um, And uh, how do you understand uh, what is the difference between a curved surface or else, uh, uh, or uh, what do you say, the uh, your flat surface? You know that when I draw a, uh, suppose you have a spherical surface, that means uh, consider a ball, the surface of a ball, and you draw a triangle over there, you know that the sum of the angles there is not 180 degree, whereas if you draw the triangle in a flat surface, in your two dimensional space uh, that is familiar to you, that is the uh, paper, so it, it sum is 180 degree. So, uh, this is uh, how I can simply explain the uh, difference between a flat surface and a curved surface. So it, it was just only uh, in the past 30 to 40 years that these objects, uh, mm, idealized objects, mm, uh, actually uh, uh, 
uh, was re were replaced or else the study the study of these idealized objects started moving towards the uh, what do you say irregularity surfaces or else i should say irregular objects that we are going to discuss and study so uh, these type of irregular objects and their properties actually are studied in uh, fractal geometry so um uh, having uh, let this uh, uh, so this this was one example which i was telling you about the triangle just to explain to you how the difference of a geometry on a flat surface and curved surface can be un understood now coming to the idealized objects see what exactly is the first difference that i can explain to you uh, when i say idealized objects that's the regular objects or the euclidean objects that we were dealing in our uh, school and the non idealized objects or the irregular objects i should say which we see in uh, nature so one of the aspects would always be a uh, uh, simplest way of telling that uh, would be like uh, see if i'm having a, a, a curve you know how the uh, derivative is defined so you have a curve here and uh, you know limit delta x tends to zero delta y by delta x is defined as your dy by dx or the derivative see but how how did you uh, come to that uh, uh, come uh, to that quotient so you approximated it you uh, considered delta x tending to zero and when delta x is tending to zero you approximated this curve the curve which exactly may not be a straight line but to a straight line that is how you got this so uh, when i am actually um, considering the curves in nature or else some of the graphs that we draw uh, considering uh, the certain things that happen in nature it may not be always uh, this uh, all, uh, we may not be able to approximate it just like this to uh, what do you say straight lines by considering delta x tends to zero uh, so in order to even define the uh, derivative or the differentiability concept to be understood we need that existence of straight line actually when we zoom in or else uh, when we say when we look closer so actually in actual situation such a case may not happen uh, say for example i'll consider um, an example uh, suppose we are keeping a record uh, i have taken a graph uh, from the internet just for you to understand because since there is no chalk and board i cannot um, uh, each time go and draw and show you some of the things so um, uh, see if we are continuously keeping a record of the load at a power station uh, you will get uh, some kind of graph like this it's a time series plot only so you you know that if we actually zoom in see this is just a limitation because this is only a picture that has been taken otherwise actually if you zoom in and in even you go to the microseconds also you can see there are little changes that has been happening or else uh, what do you say uh, it it never comes approximately to a uh, a straight line so when i say that straight line approximation is not possible what does that mean actually so in order to def define the differentiability or the smoothness you know that that is required so i can say it in one way uh, like these are the curves or uh, that you see in nature uh, which may not be differentiable anywhere it is a continuous curve of course uh, but it may not be differentiable anywhere because you have those sharp points coming okay or else uh, sharp edges that comes and you know that uh, differentiability means its smoothness and if you no don't see that smoothness there that means uh, you see rough rough curves or roughness uh, in the curve as and when you zoom in also so that doesn't doesn't get an approximation to a straight line or that smoothness part is missing so in most of the cases as uh, it was mentioned in the beginning uh see when you consider the bark of a tree also how much ever you try to go close to the bark uh, the surface you can still see some irregularities even though we do an approximation of a uh, uh, that uh, tree using a cylinder you and which is a smooth uh, euclidean object but you know that actually if you consider uh, go to a walk into a forest and see a tree it is never smooth so as an uh the more and more you try to go closer or zoom still you can see more and more of that uh, irregularities or the roughness that i was talking about so i can consider this uh, object uh, or this non idealized objects or the objects that you see in nature in this way also <clears throat> sorry that th those are the curves which are continuous so if i'm talking about a fractal curve it may be a curve which is continuous but may not be differentiable so uh let us see just uh, the history having just given you a brief idea of what fractals are and we will see one by one the properties 
So even though this uh, fractals uh, the name was not coined earlier, but you can see uh, uh, the mention about all these uh, such type of curves exactly uh, in early 17th century uh, by uh, Leibniz. Uh, I know all the mathematicians would be familiar uh, with this name. He was a great mathematician and philosopher. And he was talking about uh, recursive self-similarity. And self-similarity is one of the property of uh, fractals. Self-similarity means a portion of it is similar to the whole structure. OK, so uh, so in that, uh, what he has mentioned about the recursive self-similarity coming, but it was only considered in the uh, straight line case. So he did not do much. And this was the curve, uh, the curve which, uh, which I'm mentioning about uh, which uh, came in the uh, paper by Carl Westras. Uh, and uh, he actually uh, demonstrated or, uh, a graph in which uh, actually it can be considered as a fractal because you can see the tip of this is being uh, zoomed and you see how, how much of irregularities are there. So as even if, as you zoom in, you come to see more irregularities. So this uh, was uh, dated back in 1872 and uh, Von Koch in uh, 1904 developed uh, uh, an accurate geometric definition by repeatedly trisecting the straight line. And this is actually called the Von Koch curve. So, um, so these examples can be uh, found in literature. So uh, another uh, example was the Sierpinski triangle, which was uh, constructed by uh, Sierpinski in 1915. And in 1918, you can see in the paper of uh, Fetau and Julia describing the fractal behavior associated with the mapping of complex numbers. So this also led to the ideas about attractors and repellers and eventually to the development of Julia set. OK, so these are all examples of fractals which you can see in literature. And Benoit Mandelbrot is considered to be the father of, uh, or he's called the father of fractals, who created this Mandelbrot set uh, from the studying of behavior of Julia set. And he has actually uh, termed the, uh, coined the term fractal for this object. So this is the Mandelbrot uh, set, which I have shown you. As you zoom in, you can see, you can see a cardioid here. You can see a circle. So as you zoom in, uh, it's being told that you can see uh, all the objects which are similar to uh, one way or the other, the objects that you see in the nature. So this uh, was uh, uh, the famous uh, scientist. Actually, he was not so good in uh, considered to be good in mathematics. Uh, so earlier, he uh, was not so interested in uh, algebra part, actually. So but uh, later, he realized um, mm, he realized that his strong point was uh, geometry once uh, when uh, 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 in the geometry class, a professor asked them to uh, draw the graph of an equation. So other students who were good in algebra were uh, not so analytical skills, were not uh, so easily uh, able to do it. But he was very easily able to interpret. And then he understood that he started loving geometry. And that is how he started uh, having interest in it. And all these development of fractals and to understand the beauty of fractals or to see the nature of the fractals, actually this uh, has happened or the development i should say of fractals has happened just because of the advent of computers by which we were actually able to visualize because otherwise it was all the theory that was being laid out and visualization was not that possible so he was hired in uh, ibm and he started working there and he was actually um, having the task to find uh, find out why there was a static uh, in the computer telephone uh, lines. So he graphed for one day, one hour, and one second. And he realized that all the static always remained the same. And he called it a cell similarity. So it is a character. What is a cell similarity? So it's a characteristic in which the smaller and smaller details of a shape have the same original form. And uh, see, this is how he actually explained cell similarity. And he has done this using uh, computer graphics only. Uh, see, if you have a hand, what exactly he means is, see, you can have the same shape or else the same nature or the same shape being repeated at the edges. So it, at every edge, so it goes on and on in of different scales. So you can say different parts or smaller parts, if I take, it can be a scaled version of the whole. So uh, this is how he has uh, just explained it. And I'll just show you how he constructed uh, this Mandelbrot set. So what he did is he tried to solve a problem uh, presented by a young mathematician uh, named uh, Julia. Uh, the recursive formula 
you all know what it is. So x is equal to x squared plus one. So what you do is you start with the seed or else an initial point, and then you plug in the same values and you repeat, you iterate it, and see what happens. So uh, to substitute a number for x on the right, and you get an answer. Then you substitute the value in the right again. And using this IBM computers, he graphed this equation, and this is what he got. See how is this obtained on how this plotted? I'll just show you. So this is exactly the graph of the equation x is equal to x squared plus c. And as you zoom in, you see that uh, see the self similarity property or self similar nature of this. And this uh, uh, shape or this similar or this kind of shapes he started calling fractals. And this is uh, very well known as the Mandelbrot set. So earlier, uh, the mathematicians, as I told you, you can see it in the 17th and 18th century also. And that time, no, all these kind of equations, um, uh, the mathematicians used to call them as uh, fractals or monsters. Uh, that's because it iterated infinitely. And it was difficult, actually, uh, to understand the mathematical properties or uh, define it mathematically. So until and unless this computer graphics or computer uh, was invented, uh, it became very easy for us to see it and then start appreciating it. So one of the famous or major example, I should say, is a classic uh, set uh, in set theory, that is the Cantor set. So this is how you start. Okay, You have x squared plus constant. This is a function. So you start with the seed or an initial value, x0. So, uh, so you have x1 is equal to x0 squared plus constant. So x2 will be x1 squared plus constant. This is how you iterate it. Okay? So what happens is, uh, uh, so this uh, will give you the orbit of x0. Where does it go? So let us consider what is happening. Now let us consider uh, the case where x0 is 0. So you get x, x1 as 1, x2 as 2, x2, x3 as 5. So it goes on bigger and bigger, and you know that it tends to infinity. Okay. So this value tends to infinity. Now, this is the case where you have x squared plus 0. So then it is x squared plus 0 and your seed is 0. So you have a fixed point there. Now, suppose you are considering the function x squared minus 1 again with seed 0. So you're changing this c. Actually, it was x squared plus c. And you're trying to change this c and c, uh, the constant c, x squared plus, uh, uh, instead of c, I'll say x squared plus k. So that k is a constant. And you're trying to change these constants and c how it behaves or where does that point go so when i consider change this uh, c to minus one or this constant to minus one and start from c zero so you see it goes to zero minus one zero minus one that means it's a two cycle now i just change it into 1.1 minus 1.1 and you see that it is minus uh 1.1 then 0.11 so it goes on and on so you need a calculator or a computer to go to further steps. So for small real values of c, the orbit of 0 goes to infinity, you have seen. But for some other values, the orbit of 0 does not escape. So does not escape means it doesn't escape to the infinity. So it, it roams around, or else it is either a fixed point, or else it, uh, uh, it is a two cycle. Uh, so this is what is being seen. So uh, we are coming to complex now. Actually, it is a complex iteration. So now we are going to the complex space. The same function, z squared plus c, the only difference here is instead of real, now we are considering the uh, complex. So you know that complex space means you need two-dimensional space. So let us consider the function z squared plus i, again with uh, the initial point or the seed as 0. So you get 0, i, minus 1 plus i, minus i, minus 1 plus i, minus i, minus 1 plus i. It's again a two space. So if I have to plot, you know that I have to go to the two-dimensional space because uh, you are now in the complex number plane. And this is what you get. So just to explain, 0, y, minus 1 plus i. So it just uh, uh, keep on shifting between minus 1 plus i after the two points. Uh, so it is 0, then i, then it is uh, minus 1 plus i, then minus i, minus 1 plus i, minus 1 plus i. So this is how it behaves. Now suppose I am changing my c to 2i, a complex number again, with the c 0. So I get this, so 0, 2i, minus 4, plus 2i. So it becomes bigger and bigger. And you need a calculator, a computer to do this. And you see that it goes to infinity. So now we are in the complex plane. You know that you have two parts, imaginary and real part. So the same observation only. Some orbits of 0 goes to infinity. Others uh, does not. Okay. So he changed C and then 
calculated. So for all these C values, how did he calculate this Mandelbrot set? So all these C values for which the orbit of zero does not go to infinity. Uh, so why are we only talking about zero? You will be wondering why the seed is only considered to be zero and why is it not considered to be any other? Because that is because zero is uh, the critical point of this function, z square plus c. So that is why we are interested and in, so he started. So now start, this is your complex number grid and um, uh, each grid point, you know, it's a, some complex value. And now you compute the orbit of zero for each C. So we have calculated, I have shown you so few examples by changing C. So you are considering those constants also as uh, complex numbers. So we did it for I and then we did for two I. So when we compute uh, these orbits of zero for each different C, you see, we saw that some of them escapes to infinity, some of them may not escape. And how fast does it escape to infinity was seen. Some points or some values of C actually made that function or that C to escape to infinity much faster compared to some other values. So what he did is he computed. Uh, so with com computer, you it's very easy for you to generate these values for by varying this uh, C. And what he did is uh, he tried to plot this in a complex plane. So he gave the color red to those points uh, for which the orbit of zero escape uh, very fast uh, to infinity. Then he uh, gave orange color for much smaller points, uh, which uh, was escaping to infinity. And see, for all each of these, see, he computed the orbit of zero. And for each of these, and he sees that the orbit of zero escapes, and he started coloring it in this order. And OK, finally, uh, compute the or, uh, orbit of zero for each C. And if the orbit does not escape, uh, so we have seen some cases where orbit does not escape to infinity. And for all those points, he started uh, uh, coloring black. OK, so this is how he got it. So he started the um, plotting these values of C in the complex plane for which it escapes to infinity and doesn't escape to infinity. And again, gave different shades to the points or the areas where, uh, uh, depending upon how fast it was escaping, the orbit was escaping to infinity. That is how he came to uh, this curve. And this is one of the considered to be one of the beautiful uh, curve that has been uh, created or constructed mathematically. So, OK, uh, so this was actually uh, so talking about dimension dimension when I was uh, uh, talking about uh, this idealized. So I just led a ground to you like fractal geometry. What is the difference? from the Euclidean geometry. And now, uh, see, this was one of the famous question um, and that uh, Mandelbrot uh, asked, how long is the coastline of uh, Britain? So uh, it, this uh, was in a statistical sim cell similarity and fractal dimension. So this was uh, one of the earlier works uh, by Louis Fry Richardson. So he tried to answer that. So. Um, when you uh, see, uh, when you see, uh, hear that question, so you will feel that what is a big deal about it? I can just uh, go around the coastline of Britain, you know, it's an island. Uh, so I can just walk around the coastline and then just uh, see. Actually, I can go with a tape or else a ruler uh, and then start measuring it. What's the big deal? Even though you may take uh, maybe a few days, uh, but still you can do it uh, properly. Then uh, see it. Uh, he, uh, when you actually start doing it, you understand that uh, the measurement or the value that you get for the length, or as the perimeter, as we say, uh, would depend upon uh, the yardstick or else the um, measure measuring stick that you have in hand. Say, for example, uh, I have tried to just put in two figures. Say, suppose uh, your unit is two hundred kilometers. Your scale that you are going to measure, the tape that you are going to measure, is two hundred kilometers. So this is what you will get. So the length will be 2,400 kilometers approximately. So you feel like, no, and it's clear, very clear that uh, this is some weird shape uh, which has been uh, taken uh, from the map. And I should say, like, uh, when actually I just use 200 kilometers, this I'm missing out so many part of this length. It's very clear to you. So because from here, if I have to use a straight scale, so all these things are this this much of the perimeter part is lost and this much is lost. So many uh, details you are losing or else I should say they're part of the lengths that you're using. So then what do you try to do? You try to go with a, a smaller scale. 
on a smaller measuring scale and try to do the same. So suppose now I am taking the unit of my scale as 50 kilometers, then you see that the length you are going to get is 3,400 kilometers. See this, uh, again, you're not satisfied because you know exactly uh, that, again, so many features are being left out. Uh, so I can, again, go and make the measurement stick smaller uh, from 50 kilometers till you feel like it is uh, a bigger scale to measure. But when considering the coastlines or the maps of uh, the countries, it, it's quite... Uh, um, you you feel like you cannot go still further, but you can go. Mathematically, when we are talking, you know, as mathematicians, you can go till it extends to zero, right? So whenever we say this, uh, this is like I'm reducing the size of this measurement scale or the yardstick. And as mathematicians, we all know that uh, we can keep on decreasing. Okay, for when, when I uh, make it 10 kilometers, again, you see the length is going, uh, coming to a bigger value. is also too much then I, to, I come to centimeters i come to millimeters because you see that along the coastline anytime you walk you see like there are some pebbles or something lying and all those borders you need to measure so you take finer and finer and as a mathematician you all know that we can do it because what is it being seen you see like as you uh, keep on decreasing the uh, measure of your uh, yardstick or the measuring scale uh, you see that this length is going to infinity, I should say, or else to a very big number. That is what is meant by infinity. You all know that. So, uh, but you can see that the length or the perimeter of uh, this is going to infinity, but you know that it is enclosing a finite area. So this is uh, something, uh, this is actually uh, some property that you can observe uh, with respect to the natural curves. Uh, most of the natural curves, uh, you find uh, something like this, the uh, coastline or else uh, some natural objects, say, for example, to the higher dimension. If I say, uh, if we go to the surfaces, you can see your lungs. So what is it? See, in uh, some natural curves that you see, you can see that uh, they are having infinite length, but they are enclosing a finite area. In the same way, if I go to a higher dimension and see a natural object like lungs that is inside us, we see that. Uh, see what do you what is the lung uh, purpose of a lungs you know that its uh, purpose is to absorb um, uh, oxygen okay as much as possible from the air and so what sh what should be should it be like so it should be like having maximum surface area uh, so that it gets exposed to maximum air and so that it can absorb it but you know that lungs has to fit in, inside our body so it should have a finite volume okay so uh, you can see it is, is also considered to be an example of a fractal object. And for this, what is the property that you can say? This uh, property that you can say is here when I'm going to high, higher dimension, I can say it is having uh, infinite area, infinite surface area, whereas it encloses a finite volume. So this is uh, these are the objects that I'm talking about. Uh, so you have certain things or natural this is one property i can say uh, which is exhibited by some natural objects so uh, you have infinite length uh, but uh, uh, which is bounding or uh, uh, what do you say finite area or else you have uh, infinite surface area which is which bounds a, a finite volume you know the uh, for lungs it has to have enclose a finite volume because it has to go inside uh, fit in inside our body so um See, this is a different kind of characterization, actually. The way we understand and study idealized objects will not work here, actually. So we need to need some other different format uh, or a different technique to understand all these things. So what is that? Actually, that uh, there it comes the um, notion of dimension. And actually, when um, and this is when we realize uh, that we were never uh, actually introduced to dimension uh, in our textbooks in schools. I think for mathematicians, we know the dimension once we started uh, studying certain branches of mathematics in which the dimension of certain spaces were defined depending upon in linear algebra, you know how it is defined or else in analysis, how do we deal with it? Otherwise, say for example, as a layman or as a person, uh, when we were small also, we had an idea, intuitive idea about dimensions. We used to go and watch, small children also go and watch 3D um, uh, movies. And you know what is the difference uh, between a two-dimensional object and a three-dimensional object? Or uh, even without being formally introduced or mathematically introduced, uh, introducing, um, what do you say, dimension in our schools, we were actually knowing, intuitively knowing about all these things. 
So, uh, so we know that a point is zero dimensional, a curve is one dimensional, surface two dimensional, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This was just an intuition, uh, intuitive understanding actually, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know that, uh, uh, and all these numbers were integers. You say <clears throat> zero dimension, one dimension, two dimension. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, you can see all these were integers. See positive integers that you were uh, relating to the dimensions. So now suddenly, when I say uh, you have an object which is uh, uh, not uh, having an in integral dimension, that means it's a non-integer dimension. Oh, it's very difficult for a person uh, to absorb that or uh, to understand that. I I totally agree with you. So if you have been introduced to fractals and fractal dimension, you would by this time you would have been knowing about it. But I'm saying uh, to a new person, if you just say, uh, okay, the uh, dimension of this object is one point something. Hey, how does that happen? So for us, the dimensions were always integers, positive integers. So I think this difficulty the ancient people also would have had when uh, they started uh, using numbers only for counting. No, so they had only uh, this natural numbers, and suddenly, uh, uh, suddenly, then uh, this fraction came in, and then they would also have had the same difficulty of see, uh, we know only about uh, one child, uh, like uh, five children or else uh, three three buffaloes four sheep suddenly what do you mean by a fraction half a sheep no it doesn't make any sense no so the th same thing they would have they would have also thought but in a different context or different way of understanding things or a different way of uh, or, or or a uh, way to understand different objects we may need all these uh, uh, what do you say mm, definitions or else new concepts so uh, uh, this is how actually this uh, dimension came uh, into picture. And in 1975, he coined this word fractal and uh, in which he says the uh, Hausdorff dimension uh, is greater than the topological dimension. So there are n number of dimensions, if you see, uh, uh, for uh, which has been defined in mathematics also. So he illustrated a mathematical definition with striking computer constructed visualizations. And these images captured uh, the popular imagination. And when, when you see these objects, the, the one which you saw in this uh, zooming part of uh, your Mandelbrot set also, you can see all those uh, pictures, you know, uh, which you see in the kaleidoscope. Say, for example, where you, you go to the beach and then you see you know, the, the kaleidoscope. Or else uh, I, it's been told uh, when you see some uh, some famous talk about the mathematicians who are working in fractals. They say that, uh, suppose I, I get a knock uh, on, on my head and we say, you know, like, oh, something has happened. Some stars are blinking or the shapes that comes into our eyes when you close uh, due to a hit or something like that. All these you know, sh shapes or these figures that you see uh, that comes into your eyes, all those are uh, of fractal nature, actually. Uh, so in order to understand uh, this concept of fractal, uh, so this is an example. Uh, see, this is the notion. This So here it's the definition. It's a mathematical set that has fractal dimension that is usually exceeding the topological dimension. And these are non-integral values. It's, this may fall between integers. So we need to understand this fractal dimension in order to understand uh, uh, what it is, uh, why it is uh, uh, non-integral for fractal objects. And how is it, um, uh, what do you say, mm -hmm. integer values for all the familiar spaces that you have. Um, so you uh, you know that uh, whenever I'm talking about uh, dimensions, you have dimensions of an embedding space. That is the degree of freedom with which you can uh, move. Uh, so uh, I told you, you, we are talking about geometry. You have spaces and you have objects. Uh, so when you're talking about the dimension of the uh, space, embedding space, so it's the degrees of freedom in which you can move. You say that in a one-dimensional space, uh, you have the freedom to move left or right. And uh, when it comes to two-dimensional space, you have the free freedom to move left and right, or also front and back. Uh, so in two ways, you can move. And in three-dimension, you have uh, the freedom to move left and right, uh, uh, front and back, and also up and down. So in three uh, ways, you can travel. So this is how you say about uh, dimension of embedding space, which is always an integer value. Uh, the number of uh, ways you can move or what is the degrees of freedom so it comes to be an in integer value whereas when you talk about the objects again i uh, i can tell you the fractal dimension or else in general the dimension means how much does it fill the space how much does it fill the space and how do you actually generalize uh, this understanding 
uh, so that uh, uh, you know what how the uh, dimension is measured so i came across a very good video and i thought of sharing it with you in which uh, this box dimension uh, has been very well explained how to actually calculate i would want you to just watch this it's only uh, 15 16 minutes i think This is the Van Gogh uh, snowflake which we I had uh, shown you. This is the Sierpinski triangle. of which is a perfect copy of the original just scaled down by a half a square can be broken down into four smaller squares each of which is a perfect copy of the original just scaled down by a half likewise a cube can be broken down into eight smaller cubes again each one is a scaled down version by one half and the core characteristic of the sierpinski triangle is that it's made of three smaller copies of itself and the length of the side of one of those smaller copies is one half the side length of the original triangle Now it's fun to compare how we measure these things. We'd say that the smaller line is one half the length of the original line. The smaller square is one quarter the area of the original square. The smaller cube is one eighth the volume of the original cube. And that smaller Sierpinski triangle? Well, we'll talk about how to measure that in just a moment. What I want is a word that generalizes the idea of length, area, and volume, but that I can apply to all of those shapes and more. And typically in math, the word that you'd use for this is measure, but I think it might be more intuitive to talk about mass. As in, imagine that each of these shapes is made out of metal, a thin wire, a flat sheet, a solid cube, and some kind of Sierpinski mesh. Fractal dimension has everything to do with understanding how the mass of these shapes changes as you scale them. 
The benefit of starting the discussion with self-similar shapes is that it gives us a nice, clear-cut way to compare masses. When you scale down that line by one half, the mass is also scaled down by one half, which you can viscerally see because it takes two copies of that smaller one to form the whole. When you scale down a square by one half, its mass is scaled down by one fourth, where again, you can see this by piecing together four of the smaller copies to get the original. Likewise, when you scale down that cube by one half, the mass is scaled down by one eighth, or one half cubed, because it takes eight copies of that smaller cube to rebuild the original. And when you scale down this Sierpinski triangle by a factor of a half, wouldn't you agree that it makes sense to say that its mass goes down by a factor of one third? I mean, it takes exactly three of those smaller ones to form the original. But notice that for the line, the square, and the cube, the factor by which the mass changed is this nice, clean integer power of one half. In fact, that exponent is the dimension of each shape. And what's more, you could say that what it means for a shape to be, for example, two-dimensional, what puts the two in two-dimensional, is that when you scale it by some factor, its mass is scaled by that factor raised to the second power. And maybe what it means for a shape to be three-dimensional is that when you scale it by some factor, the mass is scaled by the third power of that factor. So if this is our conception of dimension, what should the dimensionality of a Sierpinski triangle be? You'd want to say that when you scale it down by a factor of one-half, its mass goes down by one-half to the power of, well, whatever its dimension is. And because it's self-similar, we know that we want its mass to go down by a factor of one-third. So what's the number d such that raising one-half to the power of d gives you one-third? Well, that's the same as asking two to the what equals three, the quintessential type of question that logarithms are meant to answer. And when you go and plug in log base two of three to a calculator, what you'll find is that it's about 1.585. So in this way, the Sierpinski triangle is not one-dimensional, even though you could define a curve that passes through all its points, and nor is it two-dimensional, even though it lives in the plane. Instead, it's 1.585 dimensional. And if you want to describe its mass, neither length nor area seem like the fitting notions. If you tried, its length would turn out to be infinite, and its area would turn out to be zero. Instead, what you want is whatever the 1.585 dimensional analog of length is. Here, let's look at another self-similar fractal, the von Koch curve. This one is composed of four smaller, identical copies of itself, each of which is a copy of the original scaled down by one-third. So the scaling factor is one-third, and the mass has gone down by a factor of one-fourth. So that means the dimension should be some number d, so that when we raise one-third to the power of d, it gives us one-fourth. Well, that's the same as saying three to the what equals four, so you can go and plug into a calculator, log base three of four, and that comes out to be around 1.262. So in a sense, the von Koch curve is a 1.262 dimensional shape. Here's another fun one. This is kind of the right-angled version of the Koch curve. It's built up of eight scaled down copies of itself, where the scaling factor here is one fourth. So if you wanna know its dimension, it should be some number d such that one fourth to the power of d equals one eighth, the factor by which the mass just decreased. And in this case, the value we want is log base four of eight, and that's exactly three halves. So evidently, this fractal is precisely 1.5 dimensional. Does that kind of make sense? It's weird, but it's all just about scaling and comparing masses while you scale. And what I've described so far, everything up to this point, is what you might call self-similarity dimension. It does a good job making the idea of fractional dimension seem at least somewhat reasonable, but there's a problem. It's not really a general notion. I mean, when we were reasoning about how a mass's shape should change, it relied on the self-similarity of the shapes, that you could build them up from smaller copies of themselves. But that seems unnecessarily restrictive. After all, most two-dimensional shapes are not at all self-similar. 
Consider the disk, the interior of a circle. We know that's two-dimensional, and you can say that this is because when you scale it up by a factor of two, its mass, proportional to the area, gets scaled by the square of that factor, in this case, four. But it's not like there's some way to piece together four copies of that smaller circle to rebuild the original. So how do we know that that bigger disk is exactly four times the mass of the original? Answering that requires a way to make this idea of mass a little more mathematically rigorous. Since we're not dealing with physical objects made of matter, are we? We're dealing with purely geometric ones living in an abstract space. And there's a couple ways to think about this, but here's a common one. Cover the plane with a grid and highlight all of the grid squares that are touching the disk. And now count how many there are. In the back of our minds, we already know that a disk is two-dimensional and the number of grid squares that it touches should be proportional to its area. A clever way to verify this empirically is to scale up that disk by some factor, like two, and count how many grid squares touch this new scaled up version. What you should find is that that number has increased approximately in proportion to the square of our scaling factor, which in this case means about four times as many boxes. Well, admittedly, what's on the screen here might not look that convincing, but it's just because the grid is really coarse. If instead you took a much finer grid, one that more tightly captures the intent we're going for here by measuring the size of the circle, that relationship of quadrupling the number of boxes touched when you scale the disk by a factor of two should shine through more clearly. I'll admit though that when I was animating this, I was surprised by just how slowly this value converges to four. Here's one way to think about this. If you were to plot the scaling factor compared to the number of boxes that the scaled disk touches, your data should very closely fit a perfect parabola, since the number of boxes touched is roughly proportional to the square of the scaling factor. For larger and larger scaling values, which is actually equivalent to just looking at a finer grid, that data is going to more perfectly fit that parabola. Now, getting back to fractals, let's play this game with the Sierpinski triangle, counting how many boxes are touching points in that shape. How would you imagine that number compares to scaling up the triangle by a factor of two and counting the new number of boxes touched? Well, the proportion of boxes touched by the big one to the number of boxes touched by the small one should be about three. After all, that bigger version is just built up of three copies of the smaller version. You could also think about this as two raised to the dimension of the fractal, which we just saw is about 1.585. And so, if you were to go and plot the scaling factor in this case against the number of boxes touched by the Sierpinski triangle, the data would closely fit a curve with the shape of y equals x to the power 1.585, just multiplied by some proportionality constant. But importantly, the whole reason that I'm talking about this is that we can play the same game with non-self-similar shapes that still have some kind of roughness. And the classic example here is the coastline of Britain. If you plot that coastline into the plane and count how many boxes are touching it, and then scale it by some amount and count how many boxes are touching that new scaled version, what you'd find is that the number of boxes touching the coastline increases approximately in proportion to the scaling factor raised to the power of 1.21. Here, it's kind of fun to think about how you would actually compute that number empirically. As in, imagine I give you some shape and you're a savvy programmer, how would you find this number? So what I'm saying here is that if you scale this shape by some factor, which I'll call s, the number of boxes touching that shape should equal some constant multiplied by that scaling factor raised to whatever the dimension is, the value that we're looking for. Now, if you have some data plot that closely fits a curve that looks like the input raised to some power, it can be hard to see exactly what that power should be. So a common trick is to take the logarithm of both sides. That way, the dimension is going to drop down from the exponent and we'll have a nice clean linear relationship. What this suggests is that if you were to plot the log of the scaling factor against the log of the number of boxes touching the coastline, the relationship should look like a line and that line should have a slope equal to the dimension. So what that means is that if you tried out a whole bunch of scaling factors, counted the number of boxes touching the coast in each instant, and then plotted the points on the log-log plot, 
You could then do some kind of linear regression to find the best fit line to your data set. And when you look at the slope of that line, that tells you the empirical measurement for the dimension of what you're examining. I just think that makes this idea of fractal dimensions so much more real and visceral compared to abstract, artificially perfect shapes. And once you're comfortable thinking about dimension like this, you, my friend, have become ready to hear the definition of a fractal. Essentially, fractals are shapes whose dimension is not an integer, but instead some fractional amount. What's cool about that is that it's a quantitative way to say that they're shapes that are rough and that they stay rough even as you zoom in. Technically, there's a slightly more accurate definition, and I've included it in the video description, but this idea here of a non-integer dimension almost entirely captures the idea of roughness that we're going for. There is one nuance, though, that I haven't brought up yet, but it's worth pointing out, which is that this dimension, at least as I've described it so far using the box counting method, can sometimes change based on how far zoomed in you are. For example, Here's a shape sitting in three dimensions, which at a distance looks like a line. In 3D, by the way, when you do a box counting, you have a 3D grid full of little cubes instead of little squares, but it works the same way. At this scale, where the shape's thickness is smaller than the size of the boxes, it looks one-dimensional, meaning the number of boxes it touches is proportional to its length. But when you scale it up, it starts behaving a lot more like a tube, touching the boxes on the surface of that tube. And so it'll look two-dimensional, with the number of boxes touched being proportional to the square of the scaling factor. But it's not really a tube. It's made of these rapidly winding little curves. So once you scale it up even more, to the point where the boxes can pick up on the details of those curves, it looks one-dimensional again, with the number of boxes touched scaling directly in proportion to the scaling constant. So actually assigning a number to a shape for its dimension can be tricky, and it leaves room for differing definitions and differing conventions. In a pure math setting, there are indeed numerous definitions for dimension, but all of them focus on what the limit of this dimension is at closer and closer zoom levels. You can think of that in terms of the plot as the limit of this slope as you move farther and farther to the right. So for a purely geometric shape to be a genuine fractal, it has to continue looking rough, even as you zoom in infinitely far. But in a more applied setting, like looking at the coastline of Britain, it doesn't really make sense to talk about the limit as you zoom in more and more. I mean, at some point, you'd just be hitting atoms. Instead, what you do is you look at a sufficiently wide range of scales, from very zoomed out up to very zoomed in and compute the dimension at each one. And in this more applied setting, a shape is typically considered to be a fractal only when the measured dimension stays approximately constant even across multiple different scales. For example, the coastline of Britain doesn't just look 1.21 dimensional at a distance. Even if you zoom in by a factor of a thousand, the level of roughness is still around 1.21. That right there is the sense in which many shapes from nature actually are self-similar, albeit not perfect self-similarity. Perfectly self-similar shapes do play an important role in fractal geometry. What they give us are simple to describe, low information examples of this phenomenon of roughness, roughness that persists at many different scales and at arbitrarily close scales. And that's important. It gives us the primitive tools for modeling these fractal phenomena. But I think it's also important not to view them as the prototypical example of fractals, since fractals in general actually have a lot more character to them. I really do think that this is one of those ideas where once you learn it, it makes you start looking at the world completely differently. What this number is, what this fractional dimension gives us, is a quantitative way to describe roughness. For example, the coastline of Norway is about 1.52 dimensional which is a numerical way to communicate the fact that it's way more jaggedy than Britain's coastline. The surface of a calm ocean might have a fractal dimension only barely above 2, while a stormy one might have a dimension closer to 2.3. In fact, fractal dimension doesn't just arise frequently in nature. It seems to be the core differentiator between objects that arise naturally and those that are just man-made.
ma'am, you are not audible, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. It's not audible. Ma'am, it's not audible. Can you hear me now, ma'am? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Is it okay now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, it's audible now. Uh, sorry for that. I don't know what happened. Uh, ma'am, uh, what about the video? Did you were you able to hear the sound? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay, okay. Thank you so much. I thought you missed the uh, audio of that uh, video which I showed. Yeah, uh, so this was what uh, we were talking about uh, the box dimension. This is a just a generalization of uh, see if we uh, just uh, when in the starting of the video when we were saying about talking about the self similar objects and the scaling factor and how many uh, how much it has been uh, the mass has been reduced when uh, based on that. But that was not a general way because we have so many objects that are not self similar also. So in order to generalize the notion of the dimension, so uh, that is how this box dimension, box counting dimension, we call it. And actually, uh, you have it in MATLAB also, I think, in build function now to find the uh, box counting dimension. So that is how it has been done. So you start, you cover the object that you have to measure with a grid. And as you zoom in, scale in uh, scale, that means you reduce the size of the mesh. You see that that constant uh, goes to a, uh, uh, see, that value goes to a constant value, or else that uh, uh, your dimension tends to a constant value, a constant approximation. That is, in general, I can uh, consider the number of uh, um, boxes of uh, length epsilon. If it is a two-dimensional object, I can I can see that it is uh, k into one by epsilon the whole square. That is this two. This two is actually the dimension, two dimension. So it was being tested with the objects, uh, the regular objects for which you know the dimension of, and it was seen that um, see so in order to get that two out of that equation as a mathematician or as, as any student, mathematics student also, you know that uh, you have to just take the log, log and get that two as ln k, um, sorry, ln n epsilon by ln one by epsilon minus ln k by ln one epsilon, sorry. As you choose your mesh size to be very small or as epsilon tends to zero, you see that it becomes ln n epsilon by ln one, one by epsilon. So that is the case. So we start, this was been, um, what do you say? studied or else uh, that is how the generalization came using the box counting dimension this is how exactly it is being done so you cover it with a grid and then you start counting it uh, and as you reduce the size of epsilon you see that uh, that power actually goes to a constant value which is actually your dimension and uh, see when it is a regular objects uh, that you see in nature uh, sorry that you have uh, your euclidean object uh, the two-dimensional objects, you see that it tends to two, whereas some of the objects which you call as fractals, 
or uh, say for example the coastline they were talking about and uh, there it was a comparison of two coastlines also of britain and also you know uh, norway and they were saying like what does exactly that value tells you there was a different scene and what does that value exactly tell you so it just tells that it's more uh, what do you say um, Uh, curvy or is jaggery the thing means it's not smooth at all compared to the britain coast so the value of roughness uh, is actually uh, been given by the uh, uh, fractal dimension or is the box counting dimension which is an approximation uh, for actually this is a generalization to any object uh, that you have uh so this is how it was being so cantor said as i've told you it is um, it is a classical example of a fractal so if i just co cover it uh, of uh, uh, of boxes of size uh, epsilon you can see that uh, see th this is using the same formula so you can see that it's a similar copy two copies of itself and uh, that is how uh, the dimension was coming to be 0.6309 and so in general fractals is a rough or fragmented geometrical shape that can be split into parts each of which is a cell reduced size copy of the whole and this property of um, fractal is been coined as uh, self similarity <clears throat> this was given by mandelbrot in his uh, uh, one of the best books on uh, on fractals which is the fractal geometry of nature and actually self similarity when i'm talking about this is just a property which has been exhibited not by all the fractals but in general when um, when we introduce and um, many of the um, uh, classical definitions also which you see uh, will always mention to the self similarity property even though it is not a property which is in common uh, with all the fractals then then when i talk about the self similarity how is it different so it is different because uh, there are different types of self similarity when there are exact self similarity similarity there there is approximate self similarity and that is there is statistical self similarity so when i just show you the pictures and uh, these images then you will be able to understand so exact self similarity is uh, so this exactly uh, um, in man made fractals i should say uh, so here you can see this is how this has been constructed from an equilateral triangle just by removing this side and again uh, including the same uh, same length side and you keep on iterating this and that is how you get this so this is like man made fractals or we have constructed from a from a regular objects by doing iterative uh, um, uh, what do you say steps so the same steps repeated n times or else till infinity so this uh, such uh, uh, objects which are fractal objects of course uh would uh be having exact self similarity whereas uh these are all uh, sierpinski triangle also here what we have done is this is one of the example so i would like to so i just uh, mark the midpoints and join them and remove this middle part so i get the three these three are remaining and i repeat the same steps with these three remaining triangles so i um, join the midpoints and draw draw a triangle and remove this portion and in from these three so i keep on repeating now i have three here three here and three here for all these three triangles i keep on repeating this process and what finally what ends end product that you get after repeating and uh, a very large number of uh, iteration uh, is what is called the sierpinski triangle so these are all man made i should say and this exhibits exact self similarity you can see that here you have exact three copies of itself and for a cantor set it's exact two copies of itself whereas some objects like this it's having approximate uh, self similarity that this certain portions will be uh, the uh, uh, you can keep on seeing the same patterns in certain parts not exactly everywhere so then you have statistical self similarity that's on an average in certain parts if you take you can see a self similarity so this these are the self similarities that you can see in nature some of the self similarities that you can see in nature so this is this was what i was talking about the lungs so you can see like this is um, of uh, infinite uh, surface area uh, and uh, enclosing a finite volume so these are so this is uh, uh, the sierpinski triangle which was mentioned in the in the video so the um, dimension is almost 1.58 and just it says that it is not a curve so uh, even though you have seen a way in the video how sierpinski triangle was constructed from a curve also so but you know that exactly it is not a curve so it its dimension is not one but it's not a two dimensional objects fully because you can see there are a lot of gaps in between so 
so that is a, that is the meaning so it is not fully in one dimension and it's not fully two dimensional so it's somewhere in between so that is how this in non integral value has come into picture okay now talking about a dimension and this a box bounding dimension is an overall accepted um, for any object not only for uh, fractal objects or cell similar objects for any object that you have in uh, nature you can just uh, use this box bounding dimension to get the approximation and uh, then you the slope of that log log plot will actually give you the dimension now coming to the pure mathematics part say suppose i have to consider the fractal as a set and how do you define it for that you need to have a, a set okay so for ease well, let us consider the euclidean space that you are familiar with say rn so for uh, so i'll call it an x a general space and wherein h of x denote the non empty compact subsets of uh, x and uh, you define a hausdorff metric on this new space that you have defined that is h of x or h of rn that is the non empty uh, set of all compact subsets of rn or else x and then this hausdorff metric is the maximum of distance of ab and distance of so you start with the euclidean uh, space uh, euclidean metric there the d and uh, this uh, hab uh, the distance between two sets are defined as the maximum of dab and dba and you can uh, it's been proved that under this hausdorff metric uh, your space hx is complete and now uh, iterated function system is a uh, um how you can mathematically construct a fra fractal set okay so you hyperbolic ifs means you have a complete metric space xd uh, together with a finite set of contraction mappings and you know that a contraction mapping means it's um it's a continuous mapping uh, so it's uh, just uh, scales the entire this thing to uh, a smaller a smaller value okay so uh, you have a uh, complete metric space xd together with the finite set of contraction mappings on the space and uh, with respect for each of these contraction mapping you will have a contractivity factor and the ifs means a complete metric space together with a finite set of contractions and you know what a contraction is uh, you have a mapping and it's a, a continuous mapping in the, where the norm is less than or equal to c times norm x minus y and uh, where the c has to be in between 0 and 1 and this is e equality you say it's a similarity transform okay all these things are basic mathematics which you know so in iterated function system how exactly is been a fractal uh, or else uh, the uh, attractor of this ifs is defined as a fractal actually it's, it's coming as a fixed point of this um, contraction mappings so you start with a um, Uh, complete metric space you have a finite set of contractions and uh, uh, then you define using the set of contractions you define a new contraction on the new complete space that you have formed that is hx hx means the set of all non empty compact subsets of x and with the hausdorff metric small h so you define a new transformation which is a contraction mapping that is w is equal to union of all these wjs that means all the contraction finite contraction mappings on your um, metric space x complete metric space xd and uh, you know that uh, a contraction mapping on a complete metric space will have a fixed point and this fixed point this unique fixed point uh, a of uh, in hx is defined as the attractor or else which is a fractal object so as a fixed point of a contraction mapping how do you define so you start with a complete metric space and a finite set of contractions which you call as the ifs and using that contractions you define a new contraction in a new space a new space is the space of all non empty compact subsets that you form with this um, uh, of x and there for that and then you prove that you define a metric there and you prove that that space is complete under that metric and for this contraction then you get a unique fixed point and that fixed point can be so uh, when i have to say this so uh, uh, you may not understand it because it's a general picture that i'm giving so say for example i i i have told you cantor set is a uh, is an example and how do i generate it in the same way so i think i'm running out of time sir i will take only 5 more minutes uh, see um So suppose I have my uh, normal uh, real space uh, with the normal Euclidean metric that you are familiar with, and uh, you know that it's a complete metric space, and you are going to consider the IFS. You are considering your uh, uh, x as your closed interval zero one to start with, and these are the two contraction mappings that you are going to operate or else to generate the scanter set. These are the two contraction mappings that you require. So.
how is it? Because you know, when I plug in this to F1, I get the interval 0 to 1 by 3 exactly the next step. OK? And when I plug in 0, 1 here, I get 2 by 3, comma 1. So this is exactly what is your first level of Cantor set. Now what I do is I repeatedly perform this uh, mappings on. Now I perform these two mappings on this set 0, 1 by 3. You know, you get this. You keep on doing it on both the patterns. And you can see that you ultimately, after doing n number of steps, what you are uh, finally uh, left with is your is the attractor of this IFS, which is the classical uh, Cantor set. In the same way, if suppose uh, the example in two-dimensional space, if I have to generate the Sierpinski triangle, it needs three uh, three set of contraction mappings because you know that it's the uh, copy uh, of you can see three copies of itself in a Sierpinski triangle. So here, what you do is uh, your x y will go to x by two y by two. Then x uh, uh, the second mapping is x by two uh, plus so if if you take this as 0, 0, 0, 1, and say, for example, uh, half, half, say then, uh, or half, one. So then you can see uh, how it has been. So you plug in those values, and you can see it just goes to this. This entire triangle goes to these three vertices will go to this. So that is, if I plug in this, it will go to plus half. Now x is going to plus half, then you will get this part. And if I plug in this uh, coordinates here, I will get these this. OK, so this is how you generate. So keep on iterating it. And then finally, what is left with is your Sierpinski triangle. So these are the few applications, as it was being told. One of the major application is fractal antennas. And you can see that the only possible, uh, uh, the, uh, see, the size of these uh, electronic instruments is being uh, very small. And it was just possible just because of these fractal antennas, because of the efficiency, because very small, uh, actually, that Von Koch uh, curve, and many of your, uh, what do you say, antennas that you have inside your uh, mobile phone, you can see will be of the shape of a fractal. OK, so in order to capture the maximum uh, signal uh, with a very, so that means your surface, um, so your length is infinite. Uh, but uh, uh, what do you say? It encloses a smaller radius. Okay, so uh, it's just like uh, the Von Koch curve that you have, or is the shape of a, a Sierpinski carpet. You can just uh, see it inside your mobile phone. And uh, computer graphics de definitely to um, model uh, the natural objects. That is one. And another major application is image compression. So when I'm talking about the research uh, that is going on in this field, I can say uh, so you can study the different aspects or different properties, uh, the topological properties uh, of these. And uh, you can study uh, fractals as a fixed points of as a fixed point of um, uh, contraction mappings. That is one area where you can explore. And uh, you can uh, think about having different types of contraction mapping. What will the resultant uh, fractal be like? And what are the uh, different uh, properties, the properties that changes accordingly? And then uh, there are transformations on fractals also. Uh, and image compression is one of the examples uh, that you can see uh, where engineers would be working on. And in climate studies or also, because where uh, linear approximation uh, um, is not enough, fact interpolation. So linear interpolation is what we do normally. And um, uh, a fractal interpolation can always give you a better approximation. So these are some of the, um, some of the uh, applications. Uh, so the time is up. I, don't, I, I just had a, a quick video, but I'm skipping that. And uh, let me just conclude because the time is up. I don't want to uh, go ahead of the time. So let me uh, conclude uh, this um, uh, talk with a, a small uh, saying. The more you realize the smallness of your existence, the larger will become your presence. So I would request all of you uh, to make your uh, uh, to make your presence of, uh, to make us feel your presence larger. So by doing uh, the deeds in such a way that see uh, your existence, you can um, count make a count of your existence by your activities actually. So with this, I would like to uh, stop a few references and the videos which I've shared with you uh, was uh, downloaded from YouTube. 
so that reference i have not kept uh, uh, sorry for that because i added that video later earlier i thought of uh, explaining this on the chalkboard and then i felt like in one and a half hours i'll not be able to explain the entire thing whatever i want to on a fractal dimension or box counting dimension then i found this wonderful video and that is how i added so i forgot to keep the references uh, of that and uh, thank you uh, very much uh, any questions if there is i can take it so i will just stop uh, Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful session. There are some questions from participants, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, ma'am, uh, is it possible to define a vector space with 1.5 dimension, ma'am, like fractals? Uh, see, I think, uh, uh, see, if you you will have to explore uh, the way it has to be, but I think normally the fractals is been now considered as objects, not for uh, spaces. So I think uh, you can think about uh, surfaces also, which are very rough. That may be possible. But I don't know in, uh, in literature whether that is uh, still there. But normally, we talk about uh, fractal objects rather than spaces. Yes. OK. Can seismic we patterns. fractals to yes. analyze seismic patterns? Definitely, definitely. You can see in literature, you can uh, go to uh, Google. A scholar and uh, search for papers in which uh, engineers actually uh, geologists uh, geophysicists have used uh, uh, it in explaining a seismic pattern again uh, the problem is in maybe calculating the dimensions and uh, this thing but you can still do it yes it is being there yes is These fractals are hospital spaces I have not understood this actually. Uh, Hausdorff spaces means uh, no. You are saying whether fractals live in Hausdorff spaces? Then I can say yes. <laughs> you can find fractals in Hausdorff spaces. I cannot say fractal is Hausdorff space. Yeah. So we are talking about objects which are fractals actually. Oh, thank you so um, much. Can you suggest a basic book for oh, yes. learning fractals? fractals. That is the sub, uh, book where, which I have started learning uh, fractals about. I start. I actually, if I would say, I have heard about fractals when my uh, when I went to NIT to talk to uh, the um, uh, to the research guides over there to understand their field. And sir has just introduced to me, gave me one or two articles to read on fractals. And uh, then I realized like there is uh, nowhere like uh, no formal um, courses being conducted. Now you can see it on NPTEL also in uh, chaos and fractals. There is one course. Uh, which is there and uh, by offered by IIT Kanpur. Uh, I think you we, you will be able to do that. That is a wonderful uh, way of, uh, uh, of one module is giving actually an introduction to fractals. That would be a very big, uh, um, very good way of starting it. Uh, otherwise, if you ask me, I have learned it uh, from Barnsley's uh, textbook. Started learning uh, Ban from Barnsley's textbook, uh, fractals everywhere. So the new edition, I think the uh, copy, uh, I think I should be having. If you can uh, mail, uh, send me a mail, I can share you the uh, e-copy of. Let me, I don't know whether the latest edition would be possible, but to start with fractals, definitely, definitely, yes. A very good uh, way of explaining mathematically also. Yes, this complete space and proving the completeness and how they have done it. Yes, it is clearly done. I have started studying it using that textbook. Later, I have seen this NPTEL course also. So you can try that also because now it's everything is online. And uh, you can try that, yes. Is fractal, is fractal and never ending fractal? Yes, you can, you can say. So that is the how, uh, that is the beauty of it. No? So whenever I say, uh, you can go on and on. The, uh, the way I have generated also, I have shown you like uh, canter set also. See what exactly goes at the end. So uh, the thing is like you iterate it again and again and again. And what leaves is just a uh, dust, you should say, fine dust. Um, so uh, that is why the dimension is 0.6. No, it's not complete straight line. It's not zero. It's ju not just a point also. So you know that it's uncountable also. You have already proved it. Yes. I should say it is yes. Help us in study about uh, physiological and pathological functions of organs. Uh, I, uh, as a uh, mathematician who would, who is interested in fractal, I would definitely say there are applications in which, because as I've told you, um, mm, uh, I don't know how it can, the, the functions can be studied, but I think definitely, yes, because all the organs that you have inside the body, uh, it's one way or the other, other uh, fractal only. Yes. 
but what types of functions can be done uh, elizabeth from calicut okay i am also from calicut dr elizabeth <laughs> even though i am settled in mumbai i am from calicut and i have done my ni uh, phd also from nit calicut and i have done my schooling and college everything all the ed education from calicut uh details of the book on fractal is fractals everywhere uh, by um, acha my book you were asking about it's Uh, yes, purely sure. based on the research. Okay, it's purely based on uh, the mm, my research work. Actually, few of you of my research work, uh, which is being compiled into that book, and it's available on Amazon. Oh, Mandelbrot sets, and uh, this is actually another session. Mandelbrot sets okay. and uh, Julia sets. So I can uh, scope is uh, enormous. Uh, I think you can uh, find out some papers on Mandelbrot sets and start uh, doing uh, some research on that. Uh, research in the sense reading research on that, which will actually explore more and more. Because I cannot just briefly explain it. Actually, yeah. What are the advantages of fractals other than mathematical fields to other? Oh, okay. The, the actually the advantages are in other fields. I should say mathematically it's very difficult to handle, as you have understood. It's not so simple because the functions are complicated for us mathematicians. We are not so uh, good in uh, dealing with computers and uh, then approximating it. I think the major applications. Uh, one of the major application is fractal antenna only, and image compression is another example. So then uh, what do you say? Constructing this uh, wonderful uh, designs. uh what do you say uh, computer graphics all all the other fields yes yes you can just uh, google on uh, applications of fractals and go to google scholar and see all the engineers uh, even this uh, what do you say mechanical uh, people have used it to understand the uh, cracks and uh, what is the damages that is happening see so many applications you can see in the field of biology uh, in the field of biology i would say uh, see for your um, Uh, some uh, see uh, the images that you get the uh, the scanning the mri scan or something you calculate the fractal dimension of it and you see that if see it's supposed to actually have certain uh, if it is normal if it is normal it is supposed to have certain range of uh, smoothness no so if that is lost uh, and you calculate the study the differences see you can see a number of applications of, on such mri images that has been done to identify some uh, problems problems in the in the in that on those organs yes yes it is there fibonacci yes 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 definitely because you see all the all the objects that broccoli everything that you you can see that pattern is uh, fibonacci sequence only yes uh, yes it is all related structure of covid kind of a fractal uh, yes that object no uh, it looks like rambutan that is what we told yes <laughs> i can say it looks it can be a fractal of ob object yes but it's not being studied in that sense huh? fractal dimension of the hubert curve i don't remember the fractal dimension i think you will be able to get it from any of the uh, uh, sorry uh, from the literature sir i don't exactly remember golden rectangle is the golden rectangle of fractal shape see i told you uh, as a fractal just like if you ask me uh, what a living thing is i cannot give you in one sentence but instead i can list down n number of properties which has been possessed by a living object say for example uh, it moves but i say if you consider trees it doesn't move no so some properties as i told you fractional dimension also some of the objects which are not having fractional dimension fractional in the sense non integral dimension are also falling under the ca category of uh, fract uh, fractals and some doesn't which doesn't exhibit a proper self similarity also falls in the uh, what do you say uh, under frac fractals so in i cannot generalize it yes so i'm so happy to understand that uh, people have uh, liked the session can we find properties of groups or rings or other modules in mandelbrot sets i have not come across anything which uh, in which um, uh, there is uh, a work has been done but i think definitely since you have started thinking about it no so you can uh, you can you can try it out i have not come across and definitely that was not my area also uh, to be frank now from now i can start searching since you have given me an idea
Oh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Arvind Kumar. Thank you. Thank you for all those wonderful comments. I uh, hope that this will instill some uh, spark in you to uh, start your uh, uh, research on this topic or else uh, start studying this topic, even though it has been uh, uh, as a course offered as a course in many universities abroad. But in India, I don't think in uh, NIT Calicut now there is a course, but it's only for PhD students. It's not a regular course or else even an elective. It's only for a PhD course, that, uh, but still it is there. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you for that uh, uh, comment. Are there any more questions, uh, sir? I think, no ma'am, I think no more questions ma'am. Yeah, thank yeah, you, thank you so much, thank okay. you so much. Thank I would you. also thank the uh, organizers. Uh, the DG Vaishnav College also and the Postgraduate and Research Department of Mathematics and especially Vengit Ramanan sir who has been continuously contacting me and uh, to coordinate with me for this and uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you ma'am. Now I would like to inform about our department programs. The workshop C4. It means chase, crack, confer, CSER net. It is a free online coaching for CSER net aspirants. The classes will be in every Saturday, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. and every Sunday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Next program, National Conference on Mathematical Modeling with Differential Equations will be held on 14th October to 17th October 2020. And in series of webinars, the next national webinar entitled on Construction of topology from basis and sub basis, which falls on 24th October 2020 at 10:30 a.m. Thank you, shows our appreciation and conveys our gratitude. It's a sign of respect. Now I invite Dr. B. Abirami, Assistant Professor, PG and Research Department of Mathematics, and DJ Vaishnav College, to propose the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of on behalf of Postgraduate and Research Department of Mathematics, DG Vaishnav College, I am honored to have the opportunity to give vote of thanks on this special day. I extend my gratitude to our secretary, Sri Ashokumar Mundraji, and our principal, Dr. S. Santosh Babu, for their valuable support. Our sincere thanks to the resource person, Dr. S. Mirani, Associate Professor of Mathematics, Department of Basic Sciences and Humanities. Mukesh Patel School of Technology, Management and Engineering, NMIMS Bumbar, for gracing today's webinar, Mathematics of Factors. Thank you, ma'am. We are greatly enlightened with knowledge and presence. Our special thanks to our HOD, Professor R. Venkat Raman, for his effort to conduct a series of webinars during this pandemic period. I take this opportunity to thank our dedicated staff members and students for the kind cooperation. Our sincere thanks to all the participants from various institutions for their active participation in this webinar. Once again, I thank one and all present here. Thank you.